and this code. So um, I'm excited that people show up over here. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of material. I think three hours will be enough to get you start, started with VS Code and Docker, the best menu on Docker. Um, but at least I hope to give you the motivation and, and a point of reference uh, in the future if you want to deepen and uh, explore more VS Code with the uh, dev containers. So I can just share my screen. And we can get started. And I apologize. Um, I'm I'm not using Zoom often, so uh, while I'm sharing, I might need some help if there are any questions. All right. So we're going to cover today. Um, how to set up a Dockerize R development environment with VS Code. Um, the workshop is based on using Docker and uh, and the, the integration with VS Code. So just uh, for getting started, just an introduction about myself. I'm a senior manager at Apple. Um, I'm not representing Apple on this talk. I'm mainly focusing on forecasting time series and the uh, MLOps. I'm uh, our users, open source contributor. I uh, um, created in the past a few libraries related to uh, time series analysis. Uh, and I'm author of a book on this topic. Uh, in addition, I'm writing a lot of tutorials related mainly to MLOps. So if you are want to uh, learn more about both VS Code, Docker, um, and um, MLOps. So you are welcome to check my uh, uh, GitHub account. I also started in the last year to blog on Medium, mainly on dev containers, Docker, Python, and R. So also the, if you are looking for tutorials, there is more material over there. Uh, and the resource, all the workshop re uh, resources are available on this repo. Um, I may need to clean a little bit. The, I created a, a quarter book, so I will have to probably clean it up a little bit after the workshop and I will um, uh, pu publish it again. So uh, anything that in a slide will be also in a format of a code that you can go to the quarter doc and read it over there. And before getting started, the, the main requirements uh, for this workshop is you will have to have a Docker desktop or anything that is equivalent. Um, we will run uh, Docker um, to connect to create an environment. Um, and uh, the most common way to run Docker is with the Docker Docker desktop. Um, it's we'll just caveat the Docker desktop required a license for commercial uses. So if you are here for workshop, you can download. I don't think there is an issue, but if you are using it in your work, so you make sure that there are some condition uh, that may require a license. So just be aware for this. Uh, we're going to use Docker Hub account, uh, which is uh, equivalent to GitHub. Uh, this is where uh, the most common place to store images. Um, and we see how it works. Uh, VS Code, of course, and the dev containers extension. Uh, just one word about Docker, the Docker engine. So the Docker engine is what running Docker. In, if you are using Linux, you can just uh, install it uh, directly. You don't need the, the Docker desktop. On Mac and Windows, uh, you require to create a, a virtual and a system or a environment uh, or emulator to run Docker. So essentially, it's native to Linux. And this is why we're using the Docker desktop. Um, 
So the agenda for today will start with motivation, why you want to use a VS code with Docker uh, for R. Um, I assume that uh, people don't have much or little, uh, little knowledge about uh, Docker. So I think most of the time we spend about explaining the foundation of Docker. Um, I would say that I, you know, teaching Docker, you will probably need like a two full days to, you know, get you off the road. So uh, don't expect to be expert uh, after two uh, three hours, but it will give you enough to understand how Docker is work working and how you can use it or the advantages of um, Docker. I will start by showing how you can run. So there are a couple of options running R. So one of those is running R Studio Server inside a container. So we will cover this briefly. Uh, and then we'll dive into the dev containers uh, extension. And we will end up with talking about different uh, strategies and workflow uh, using R with Docker and VS Code. If you have any questions, um, feel free to you know, jump in. I have our time. I see the chat is, is uh, uh, on the back end, but let's see if I can have the chat open that I can see if there are any questions. Let me just. Okay, that's why I don't like a uh, keynote together with a. Uh, I think I cannot. Let me just make sure that I can see the chat and I need to move it to the other window. All right. So again, like if you have a question, feel free to either write on the chat. I'm trying to look at the chat uh, or just uh, um, stop me in a, with any question on the audio. All right, so I think uh, we should start with the motivation why you want to use uh, VS Code from the first place. And I think that, you know, we need to address the elephant in the room of why VS Code when you have our studio. So I created a, a table that compare with comparing the two IDs uh, by features. So if we put side by side R Studio and VS Code and compare them, there are some advantages for VS Code and some for R Studio. And I think it's a it's a function of a use case. Some people definitely, or I think the majority R Studio is the best IDE for for our use case, and some VS Code might be a solution. So uh, walk out of the box, definitely R Studio walk out of the box. VS Code it was not designed to, to walk out of the box. You will need to do uh, some customization. I see VS Code as a do-it-yourself uh, ID. Uh, this is disadvantage for some people and advantage for other people because it gives you the flexibility to customize it, but it won't work out of the box like our studio. So that's a definitely you know one great thing about our studio. Native support for R, so definitely R Studio uh, is winning here. There is no native support for VS Code. Easy to use. Again, R Studio is easy to use. VS Code is painful. Level of customization, and I think this is where VS Code is by far uh, much more flexible and uh, have more ability to customization. Uh, community support and development here VS Code is is a big winner and you know one of the reasons it's a big winner VS Code is an open source ID uh, so anyone can fork and create a, a extension or create their own ID on top of it um, and uh, it's backed by Microsoft so obviously Microsoft this is their one of their main products the amount of resources they can spent is um, much uh, bigger than uh, positive. So this, you, you would see it with the 
the extensions that uh, uh, I think what make makes what this code uh, a great uh, idea. Last but not least, this is where was for me the main motivation to move to this code. I'm working with the uh, containers and uh, this is where our studio doesn't have a native support for container and this code is uh, with the dev containers extension. So overall, again, like the question is your use case. Uh, if you do not use uh, containers, so definitely our studio, there's no question here, our studio is the tool for, for you, or at least opinion, uh, my opinion, that's like the great tool. Uh, if you are using containers, so uh, this got probably a better option. Um, and of course, it's come with some um, costs, and I think I can skip here a slide. Okay. Uh, so the pros are of this code is native Docker support, high level of customization, community support, and the extensions. Uh, the cons is like it's not working out of the box. You need to put a lot of effort. It took me a long, long time until I got to the level that it's. I can feel like it's stable. Uh, I think the last year I'm using only VS Code, uh, and there is some learning curve. Uh, there is learning curve for Docker, which are already beyond the learning curve of Docker, but then there is another learning curve about understanding how VS Code is working. And again, if you want to use Docker in your workflow with R, so I think this is where the main motivation to use uh, VS Code. So let's talk about the general architecture of uh, VS Code with the dev container. So I'm going to reference a lot to the dev containers. Um, so first, maybe I should explain what is the dev containers. The, nev the dev containers is extension uh, on VS Code that enable you to open a new session a isolated session in VS Code that is fully customized uh, and reproducible. Uh, so think about this, um, the terminology of, I would try to give the terminology from our studio as a reference. When you open our studio, usually you walk inside a project. Uh, in VS Code, you open a folder and technically the folder is the project. The difference here is that in VS Code, the dev container extension enable you to open a isolated session that uh, you can fully customize compared to the normal setting of your VS Code. So if you see the colors, you have the bluish color, which is your VS Code normal settings. But once you move to um to the container it's a different settings depending on your um settings files and the nice thing about it for people that are familiar with docker it will automatically mount your local folder to the container so you don't need to worry about it you can mount additional folders if you want uh, with the settings and the dev containers um Files, but essentially, those are the you know two files that you need to create the dev containers, which is the manifest of your uh, environment, and the settings which enable you to customize your environment. And and it's really extreme how much it enable you to customize a session. And what's great about it is it enable you to reproduce your work. And when I say reproducibility, it's not just in the level of the container, it's also the level of the ID. So for example, if I'm creating environment, I'm creating a settings.json, I'm creating a dev containers.json, I'm committing it to GitHub, uh, I'm using Docker Hub to store my image. Uh, other user can easily reproduce my code, um, have the same settings. Um, and work in the same environment. So that's what's great about uh, 
the dev containers is the level of customization and the reproducibility. So I will pause here and I will go before we are getting started talk about the uh, uh, about the uh, Docker. I will go to my VS Code uh, go over a quick demo about what you can do, and we take it from there. Uh, and I am already inside the container, so let me just uh, go to my local environment. One thing that I will mention that even when you're running a workshop about Docker, a lot of things could get wrong, uh, get out of control. <laughs> um, so if I will do a lot of live coding, uh, please be patient with stuff that are breaking on the way. Uh, but essentially that's my VS Code um, IDE. I open a folder uh, and my folder is the project, uh, the workshop repo. So it's r-medicine-vs code workshop. And there are many uh, folders because for related to the workshop, but essentially to run VS code, you need the, de the, the dot dev containers uh, folder which has the, uh, the dev container.json, which is essentially the manifest of your environment. It uh, provides the instructions for the dev containers uh, extension, what type of environment you want to use, like for example, image, and then enable you to customize your uh, VS Code extension. So for example, you could have on your local VS Code a set of extension, but when you open a, a new session on the, on the dev containers, it won't heritage those extension and you will need to specify what you want to install on that environment. Uh, the other um, cool stuff that you can do is to pass a um, environment variables, uh, environment file, and so on. Uh, another thing that uh, it comes with is the, this is really cool, the setting files, which enable you to uh, customize uh, the extension settings from uh, different settings. For example, here's like a R settings that we will touch later on um, to, for example, I can change my, uh, the type of a uh, theme. Can, can you make the font just a little bit larger? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Is it okay? Good, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, feel free to chime in if, if there is anything that is not clear. Uh, happy to pause and and expand. So for example, here I can change um, um, the default theme. So for example, I know what is the can be dark, but uh, that will change. And if I will commit it and I will use it on a different machine, uh, you will see the same thing. Uh, so that's kind of like, regardless of my regular VS Code settings, inside the container, I can customize essentially everything. Um, I don't like this one, so I think before I was default. Yeah, better. Um, so to open it inside, the uh, once you install, so on the side, uh, you have this menu here, you can see the files, um, you can uh, see the it's integrated with Git, so you can uh, use it uh, to commit or see changes. Um, there is debugging, which I did not never use. Here you see some extension that are installed on my local, uh, VS Code, and you will see that once I will open the session in the dev container, some of those will disappear because uh, they are not in the manifest of the installation. Uh, installing extension can be done from here, like if you want manually to install, so you see here it's a list of what is installed. Uh, so for example, you have Docker, uh, you can see it's a very popular, there is a uh, almost 35 million downloads for this extension. Um, there are essentially, uh, the amount of extension is uh, really, I don't know numbers, but it's huge. And there is extension almost for 
any application that you can think mainly for data, data science or development. Uh, that's the only extension that you will need if you, you want to run the dev containers, you need to install this. And once you have this, you will see that over here on the bottom, you have this uh, remote window that enable you to either SSH to server or to connect to the remote container. And here I will go and I will reopen in container. And it's take a, a few seconds. And now I'm inside the container. Um, just to give you a flavor, um, the state of mind is is different than in our studio. Uh, you will work with the terminal, so now we will open our session. And uh, I'm using now version 4.4. I'm using a Radian, which is a wrapper. It's a Python library that is a wrapper for R, which gives you the uh, the some of the nice functionality that you have in the normal IDE, for example, um, code completion, uh, colors, and so on. And have those uh, test script, for example, over here. And this is a shiny app. And this is a new extension from a, a posit that I released uh, last week. And if you can go over here, it will open the shiny app uh, on the viewer. And you can now, uh, you know, that's a nice thing that you can go and uh, uh, no, there are more tools now for shiny and it's uh, interactive. So if I will change, um, hello. Oh. It should reflect. Um, so that's how Shiny will uh, will work. Um, other thing that are available, you can see here that I have our mount to my session. I can open multiple session of R. So if you run, want to run multiple Shiny apps in parallel, um, and it, you don't have li limit of how many session you can run in parallel. So now I can open another R session uh, and I can trigger another Shiny app or I can uh, run R script. Um, and it will always like the setting that I have on my machine that you always go to the open terminal. Uh, so I can if you want, if you are, if you like to work in a multi sessions, you don't need to open a multiple VS Code uh, uh, session. You can use a multiple sessions on the terminal. Uh, another example um, is, let's say I want to run a HTML, so it's work fairly the same as you would see it in. A, um, in the R Studio, it's interactive. And similarly, like if you want to see how ggplot is working. Um, by the way, you have a lot of uh, windows that you can customize. So for example, I can, this is um, the debugger, I can close it, I can extend it, I can move the terminal to be on the side, I can have uh, multiple uh, sessions or windows. So it's highly customized, like uh, you would, you have it on uh, our studio. Uh, let's now see how ggplot is working. So we load the diamonds. You got the viewer, which is really nice uh, data viewer that uh, enable you, you know, basic functionality of sorting, um, filtering, uh, and so on. And if you want to plot. You will see it in the viewer. You can open it inside the um, so you can see it side by side inside your browser. You can open multiple um, and I can let me just resize it. So you can have uh, multiple plots and I think there is a way show history. So you can actually go and see the different plots. 
if you don't like one or you want to clean it, you can remove them. So it's fairly flexible. Uh, and this is thanks to the R VS Code extension uh, that we will talk later on. Um, so that's like a test of what you can do. Again, I feel like it's a, it's a different state of mind for what you would uh, used to in our studio. Our studio is much more convenient. Or when you're coming from our studio, there is a big shift. I think people that coming from, that used to work in VS Code, uh, this work workflow that you're working with the terminal, uh, not the console like you used to in a, um, our studio, it's more close to other languages like Python and uh, JavaScript. Um, and you can see that now in this session, I have only those two uh, extensions, uh, which are different from my default settings. Okay. Um, I will, I will pause if there are any questions for going to Docker. We will come back to this code at, at the end. Okay. All right. Um, let's start with Docker 101. So in, in a natural Docker, the, the, you know, the big thing about Docker is reproducibility and production. And if I need to, you know, edit uh, another thing is seamless reproducibility and production. Um, I think the transitioning that I had moving from a data scientist to a data science manager is that as a manager, you want, you, you, you think more about how to take your work into production, how to scale. And I think that was the shift that, uh, you know, one of the trigger to move to Docker, because in many cases you will deploy your, your work into, uh, a remote server or a, um, you know, running stuff on Airflow or Kubernetes and so on. And this is where having containers um, um, makes your life easier. So let's talk about reproducibility and how Docker um, is bringing reproducibility. So think about this, uh, if you're working in some lab, uh, this is the old example, so it was, uh, <laughs> I use I, I think I use it in a some workshop in university. But the idea is like you know co in collaboration, this is where Docker can solve you a lot of problems. And if all the you know there's a lab, you're all running the same code. Uh, you're using R, uh, you're using Git. So your code, you're running the same code. You're using version control, uh, and you set a seed uh, to lock down the randomization of your um, the random number that you're creating if you're using some randomization. And then, uh, you know, one student get a, a result of 5.297. Uh, another student will get 5.299, which is uh, fairly close, could be the definition of the rounding. And another user will get 5.3 and the professor will uh, end up with an error. And when you dive into, you know, the reasons for getting these uh, results, you can start to look at the environment setting. So you see that uh, using different versions of R might end up with different results. Uh, mainly think about like there was a bump on version four, um, some new features uh, that may not, they were not uh, exist before. Also that the, the versions of your um, packages definitely will impact your results. Uh, it could be that some functionality of the package change from by the 
on the new versions of the package. Uh, so you may not be able to reproduce the same code. And last but not least would be the OS also uh, might have some impact because think about it, our using on the backend a lot of C compilers and frontend and they might be different from OS to OS. So this might also impact uh, the way that uh, uh, your results and ability to reproduce code. And this is where Docker uh, help you to unify your environment and uh, make sure that all running the same code under the same environment. So think about your lockdown, your R version and your packages and all running the same code. Generally, uh, most likely they're all going to be the same results. There are some caveats. Uh, so I will talk about it in a second, but generally Docker, I think is the one of the most robust tools for uh, reproducibility. And now let's talk about the production problem. And you know, if you go to Stack Overflow, you will see all those, um, mainly in, in the context of Shiny, a lot of uh, um, problems that people had that they were able to run stuff locally, but then it failed when they deploy to the server. And this is related to the lack of consistency between the development environment and the environment on the server. So this is something that um, definitely Docker help you to solve. And this is a, a problem that I spent a couple of hours until I realized that, uh, you know, now it's, it seems like a very ridiculous problem, but uh, essentially um, a colleague of mine was trying to run, uh, to uh, render some plots and we wanted to, to improve performance on a Shiny app. And uh, the goal was to deploy it and uh, uh, load the plots from the files rather to calculate it on the fly. And so he hand off me the, the folder with the plot and I got this error. And now it's very obvious what is the error because I had to spend some time, but you know, like it took me a while. Anyone want to guess what is the error here? Different version? Yes. Um, so when you, we try to run a cross talk and when you save the, um, the plots as a files, as an object, as an object, it will look to the path as it, uh, was, uh, created. So in this case, uh, the, my colleague used version 3.5 and my version was 3.6. Um, so key take out, uh, working with Docker could save you a lot of, uh, unnecessary pain and grief. I would caveat that learning Docker come with a lot of pain and grief. So choose your battle. Uh, I don't have like a, you know, uh, right or wrong answer, but I think if you are, if you are interested in scale working uh, and deploy stuff and you're working with GitHub Actions or you're working with the uh, Airflow, uh, you're deploying uh, stuff, your code on other system, especially on system that doesn't support R by default, um, like Airflow. Airflow is a Python uh, library. Uh, it's uh, for orchestration. And by default, yeah, the only way to run R uh, without, you know, inventing the wheel is just throw a container with a script and we run it. Uh, but essentially that it solved the reproducibility and this is another example, like, you know, illustrate what could grow wrong uh, during deployment it is Python, but it's also relevant uh, to R. So essentially, you know, code, if you are not uh, using the same code, definitely you're going to have problems. Uh, if you are not using the same uh, libraries versions. This also could create uh, some issues. The R or Python in this case version, uh, Python is much more sensitive, but like uh, also R 
change over the years and uh, from version to version there are new features and that may not uh, available on the um, older version so that's something also that could uh, create uh, issues uh, different uh, operating systems they have different compilers I know for those who used profit uh, is example that uh, profit the library that uh, it uh, render stuff with C and whenever you change the C compiler uh, on the back end, it's just not working. Uh, last but not least, and this is a, a relatively new problem thanks to thanks to Apple, uh, but um, the CPU technology also now there is ARM became very dominant with the uh, Apple Silicon and the uh, uh, compared to Intel. So those are the things that uh, also could create your code not run because uh, a lot of builds were either built to one and if you build image uh, to one uh, CPU technology, it may not work on other. So for example, good example, if you go to Quart Quarto, uh, you will see it on the download. There is a, a build for each uh, CPU type uh, and that's something that uh, you know I try once to run something on VS Code with Quarto and it just didn't it got stuck and until I realized that I just uh, download I build it on uh, my Intel Mac and it didn't work on on the uh, M1 but essentially Docker cover you um on the environment. Uh, GitHub enable you to for version control and to make sure that you're running the same code. And together those two enable you to um, create a reproducible environment. Where it could go wrong is the hardware. Uh, Docker has some uh, advanced features that enable you to um, build container for multiple uh, CPU architecture and it automatically will identify, uh, but that's it's a little bit more advanced. Uh, but generally, for the most use cases, those are the stuff that will break the, the versioning, the operating system. If a uh, few people, uh, if you are working in a teams that are using different type of uh, OS um, or different types of a uh, um yeah, you know um, machines um i think docker probably will the solution for you with the caveats that you need to be minded for the cpu issue so docker in natural is um enable you to shift your code uh to remote uh, either remote server uh like uh, aws gcp or azure if you're using github action seamless deployment uh, over there with Docker, uh, or just for, you know, uh, for a colleague, um, that's a great solution. And those are the couple of uh, data science applications um, that uh, I thought about them. And there might be, probably there are more than what I'm going to talk, but uh, essentially, you know, the first one is CICD, if you're working with GitHub Action, um, Definitely, you want to use deployment with uh, uh, Docker. I I started to use GitHub Actions during the pandemic. I uh, the first beginning of the pandemic, I created a package that tracking the COVID cases from the John Hopkins uh, uh, repository that uh, provided in a in a tidy format and. Uh, I was, at the beginning, I was refreshing the data manually until I realized that it's going to be long uh, pandemic uh, and um, it's not uh, something I can do every day. And I was looking for solutions and I got to GitHub Action. That, that, at that point, it just, I think it was very new GitHub Action. I started to use Rlib and uh, that's like the alternative for Docker, but it was not as stable because of a variety of reasons uh, that every time that you are 
running a session and install it from scratch. And this is where things could go wrong. Um, once I moved to Docker, that was a big uh, motivation for me to move to Docker. It was stable. Like for the most of the majority of my pipelines, I have uh, many pipelines in that running daily on a uh, GitHub Actions and very stable with the uh, Docker. So that's a major one. If you're running data automation or uh, anything that requires GitHub Action, that's a great use case. Uh, package development. Um, if you want to connect like uh, checks whenever you commit, uh, it's the same. You set your uh, environment and just let it run whenever you are committing. It will automatically be checked. And uh, the idea is that if you check the the environment and test it on your local machine inside the container and you shift it with the container, it should work. Uh, unless there is a, like extreme cases, but for the majority, it's covered from the majority of the uh, things that typically fails during the deployment. Um, code review, it's another great use case. Uh, if you are collaborating between um, different uh, team uh, members, uh, that's like usually um, the best way to, if you're debugging, to reproduce, I always ask to have a container that I can uh, reproduce or test the code. Uh, dashboard automation, if you are, uh, that's a, a flex dashboard, but now Quarto dashboard, if you are using it and you want to deploy also in GitHub Action and using GitHub Pages, uh, it's also another use case. Uh, statistical and machine learning application, definitely uh, high level of reproducibility. Uh, if you want to deploy on Hugging Face, a Shiny app is now enabled with a Docker. So it's a, either you can use a freestyle uh, Docker deployment or uh, use the built-in Shiny for Python and R or Quarto, but it's required Docker. So I hope that I convince you to, you know, why you want to use Docker, uh, or at least is it, if it's applied for your use case, I think that's a, uh, you should consider it. So let's talk a little bit about the, and I will pause here. If there are any questions, I, I'm not tracking the, let me see if there are any questions. Okay, I see that people share that someone asked the links and okay, I see most of the questions are about the links and the font. Okay, there is a question about versions. Uh, uh, from Curtis, could you? Uh, elaborate what is the, which version you're referring to? I was just saying that it was the version that was mismatched in your screenshot. That's all. Oh, okay. Um, on the, on the build of the lab? Good question, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, general architecture of a uh, Docker. Let me go back to my VS Code for my keynote. So, you know, in, in natural, again, like Docker is a platform for OS level virtualization. So regardless if you're using Windows, Mac OS, uh, Linux, it's an, it's, it's provide on top of it a layer of uh, OS virtualization that enable you to run containers. Um, the idea of containers is, is isolation, it's isolate your workflow from your local settings. And that's what may, make it reproducible. You package your, uh, you set your environment, you package it inside a, an image and that's how you shift your software or applications. It's very popular, or at least it used to be very popular for JavaScript developers that are work on web development until I believe now there is a shift for a web assembly. But uh, if you go and look for Docker tutorials. I learned most of my tutorials from JavaScript developers. So it was very uh, common workflow or tools that uh, 
uh, web developer used in the past. Enable seamless shipment and deployment of your code. Uh, so Docker is is a is a open source and free for non-commercial um, and for enterprise. Uh, there is a requirement a license. There are so Docker is just a tool. There are or Docker desktop. Uh, there are alternative uh, that are open source. I to be honest, I never tried the alternative, but there are some open source alternatives you want to use. So how does it work? You have your uh, infrastructure, so your machines, server, uh, you have on top of it the operating system. And then um, on top of it, you lay your Docker engine. And this is enable you to run containers regardless of what the operating system is. And that's the isolation. And you can deploy uh, many apps. So think about it like Kubernetes, that's the idea of Kubernetes. You're spinning um, many apps. And the nice thing about it, if one app is failing, you can just shift again the container and uh, quickly to uh, rerun the app. Uh, for Mac users and um, Windows, you require a Docker desktop because it's a, essentially, I hope I, I'm, I'm not uh, mismatching, but it's a, it's a Linux, it's more Linux uh, tool that's running natively on, that the Docker engine run natively on, on uh, Linux uh, and to, run Docker on Mac OS or Windows, you need to create like a virtual environment. And that's what Docker desktop provide you. Uh, it's a really nice tool. Um, the Docker desktop is uh, uh, coming with a, a app that you can customize or check what's running on your machine. Anything you can do and we'll see from the command line most of it you can do from the dashboard. Um, the main thing that you need to know is the resource allocation. Uh, you can either are the default, so uh, essentially you are creating a virtual environment on your machine and you need to be minded that it's using some resource uh, from your local machine. And so you need to be minded. So if you are running something heavy, you should expect that your anything you're running outside of the container might may have less resources to run. So be minded when you're setting your resource. In this case, for example, I'm using six CPUs out of the 12. I'm allocating a eight gigabyte of RAM, a one gigabyte of swap, and I allocate 60 four gigabyte of uh, of a disk. One of the most common um, um, errors or, or failures that you will probably encounter when you start to build images is that you're uh, running out of a disk. Uh, and you know you need to be reminded like either you get a, a very nice error message that uh, memory uh, disk is out or something like this. Or you just like, <laughs> and that's what happened for me a lot, many times that I, you know, I'm trying to find, you know, the, the error uh, logs sometimes are very convoluted and spend a lot of time until you realize, oh shit, I, I ran out of RAM. So be minded for how much you um, allocate and also prune your um, images. So once in a while you can prune, I will show you how to do it, but you want to prune because uh, the next topic is about how Docker cache uh, the images uh, for performance reasons, but it's come with like usage of disk. I think uh, we are five minutes uh, uh, before the one hour. So uh, maybe we, we can take five minutes break or we want to continue. Emily? Uh, any thoughts?
Um, how about we take a five minutes break and let people also, if you want to try to install Docker desktop, if you have question, I'm happy to, to answer. And now it's a, on my end is 1227. So we can return in, in five minutes at 1232. Any questions so far? Okay. So I'm here if anyone has question about uh, installing uh, Docker desktop, if you have some issues, I know that in Windows it's a little bit more uh, tricky. Um, yeah, and I'm here. Stop share my screen.
Uh, hello, Rami. I think you're mute. On you're muted. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know how long I'm talking to myself. Um. Oh. I I mean I just came back from the break so. All right. Um. Yeah. So. Going back to uh, Docker layers. So Docker is as a, a very intelligent uh, process to identify uh, a repeated process. And the idea is to be, for those who build in the past images, in the way you need to think about it, like you are building and if you are starting from scratch, uh, it's like you got a Linux box and you need to set all the drivers from scratch. Let's say, even if you have script, this, this is like, could take like a few minutes, if not uh, half an hour and so on. Um, and you don't want to repeat the process whenever you are doing the same thing. So this is where Docker um, is based on layers and it's caching layers. So once you build a layer, it's cached it. And if, Docker identified that you're going to use the same layer in some condition, it just will pull this layer and uh, save you the time. So, um, me... so let's, uh, let's go over layers. And the example is fairly similar to the build I used for this workshop. And uh, think about that in some cases, you may not just build a one image because the um, it will take a long time whenever you want to ch do change. So it typically, my workflow is that I have a, a, a base R image where I set my version. Typically, you don't change your R version often. You have all the compilers, and this is typically what take long to build. And then I'm using the this image to build on top of it uh, per project. Uh, so I'm customized. Uh, let's say there is a project that I'm using Shiny and I'm using a deep layer uh, and so on. So I will customize the needs for the project. Another project I'm using for casting, I might use the feeble package and other uh, application for time series. So I will more I focus more on adding on top of the best R those applications. So it's a that's my workflow, and it's saving sometimes when you are uh, starting a project. So let's let's take the scenario that uh, you want to build from scratch um, our image with uh, uh, different layers, and you want to have on top of the, the end of the this image, you want to have uh, tidyverse shiny and install our studio server. So if you start from scratch, you may use Ubuntu uh, base image. Uh, as your baseline, and then you, you're you going to add the compilers, all the requirements, the Debian uh, compilers could be C++, could be some tools like uh, crawl, git, uh, vim, and so on. And then you will install base R. And that would be like your your first image. Uh, you will tag it, let's say if it's R, ver R version 4, as base R4. And that's an image by itself. And then um, the second image, you will start by taking the best R4 that we just built and start to add layers. So uh, uh, I want to install all the tidyverse uh, libraries, and then I will add another layer with Shiny. And that's a second image, and I can tag it as tidyverse 4. And then the third image would be I want to add on top of it um, a R Studio Server. So I will take the second image as my baseline, and I will add R Studio Server, and that will be like my third image, and I tag it as R Studio Four. Uh, so you see, here there are three different images, but on the back end, there are uh, you know that's how Docker look at it. It's a one image for the for the R Studio Four. It's look as the as the layers. Um, so it's break down all the layers that were were used to build 
the, the full image. And let's say that tomorrow you want to change the R version. Um, so the way that the update will, will take place is that Docker identify where on what step you make changes. So let's say that the changes on the base R layer. So anything that before those layers will be cached. Uh, so you don't need to rebuild from scratch. Then this is a new layer. So it will build it from scratch. And the following layer, regardless if you didn't change anything on those, it will also uh, will build it because um, think about like at the cake again, like once you take something below, it will, it won't have the foundation. So like you need to uh, rebuild it from scratch. There are some advanced build methods uh, like multi-staging um, that enable you to actually be a little more sophisticated and smart when you feel, if you are changing, in this case, the best R that avoid the need to reinstall the additional layer, but that's a, to be honest, I never tried it. Um, and I think it could be more potential stuff that could go wrong. So, you know, if you're not really, uh, if you're just building a, a regular image, it's worth to spend like another half hour on the build, uh, then start to debug down the road. So let's talk about the Docker workflow. A Docker build will start with a Docker file and a Docker file essentially is the manifest of the build. Uh, it's given the instruction of, for the Docker engine, how you want to construct your image. We then use the Docker engine to build the image and the output of this process is this is this is the output you will see, and this will create a new image. Uh, this image is like an object, and once we deploy it, for example, in a VS Code or uh, in a server, uh, during the runtime, it's then to the container. So those you will hear image and container the, uh, repeating a few times in this uh, workshop. The difference between the image and the container is that the image is object and the container is the operation when it's like, it's the runtime of the image. And then you will deploy your code. So typically that's like the life cycle of a Docker. Um, we will start by uh, talking about uh, the image and how to run an image. Uh, before getting started, I will just go over quickly on the some of the tools that uh, I'm going to use in the command line. So we're going to now to shift to the command line. And if you have Docker Hub uh, set and uh, actually, I'm not sure even if you need the Docker Hub if you're not pushing, but uh, if you have a Docker desktop set, uh, you can try to run it side by side. Um, so you know, those are basic uh, command lines, uh, uh, CLI uh, commands that we're going to use, uh, LS show the file system, CD to change the directory, or the folder, MacDir is to create a new directory, uh, RM to delete a file or directory, uh, PWD is to show the current working directory, uh, and clear just to clear the terminal. Um, in a Docker file, you, you need to think that when you're building, let's say our build is based on Ubuntu, you are in a Linux system and you need to use the Linux alike language. So typically we use sudo to give permission, uh, apt to install from the Debian package manager. Uh, wget is, uh, if for example, you don't want to pull application from website, let's say you want to install Quarto, typically you will use Quarto to a uh, wget to download the binary of a uh, Quarto. Call is to um, send a URL uh, request. Uh, if you want to run R script 
from the terminal. So use the R script command uh, and bash, we going to use a little bit of bash code. All right, uh, let's start with the simple Docker CLI commands. Um, those are the commands we're going to use. They are very intuitive, uh, starting with the Docker login. I think if you don't have yet Docker this Docker app account, you can skip it. Uh, I'm not sure if you will be, I think you can pull images without login, but um, I never try always login. Uh, so Docker login is the authentication uh, that, you, that you are doing to be able to, to pull image or to push images. I think it's more relevant if you want to push images. Think about it like uh, when you are using GitHub, you need to make sure that GitHub recognize your user or the account. So that's kind of like the authentication layer. Um, Docker pull and Docker push is similar to Git uh, pull and push. It's the operation of uh, pulling image to your local system or pushing to the uh, registry on Docker Hub. Inspect is a very useful command when you want to get the metadata of the uh, container. You can see some information we're going to use to understand what are the commands that uh, this container is using on the backend um, and how to uh, environment verbal and so on. Uh, Docker images, is um, print the list of images that are available on your local machine. Docker run is the one of the main common commands when you want to run the image. And essentially that's the runtime to that enable you to uh, use, the, it, uh, use it as container. Docker PS is uh, print uh, images that are in a runtime or active containers. Docker build um, is the command to build from a Docker file an image and uh, push is when you want, once after you build, you want to push it. If you want to push it, you can use it to push it to the Docker hub. Um, Okay, so I think let's start with Docker login. I will, I will get out from the uh, presentation. I will just open uh, a, a terminal and let's maybe go. Okay, I hope this is the font I don't know if the font is uh, is okay. If if anyone wants the, that, I will increase the font. That please let me know. So Docker log in the command line, the, the font is kind of small for me. Okay, let me see if I can. Yeah, that's really good. And okay, maybe I will sh go full screen. Okay. If I can, okay. So you start with Docker login, and you see there is a because I already did the authentication. Um, so uh, it's it's it, it's not it didn't ask me anything. So it's a login succeed succeed. But if it's the first time, it will ask you for your user. Uh, and uh, your user and password. And maybe if I, so that's the, that's the website. So like, think about this is kind of like the GitHub of the images. And if I will go and log in, I will also, uh, it's automatically authenticated, but you can see here I have my, uh, the images that I I pushed in the past. Um, so that's the that's the that's that's the first thing. I think if you probably if you don't have account, you can skip it. You can pull, but you won't be able to push. If anyone want to try and let me know 
uh, please please comment or uh, chime in. Um, the next thing we want to do is let me just pull it up. Uh, Docker pool. So Docker pool. Right. To... All right. Uh, Docker pool as it... You know, as the name imply, it's pulling image. Uh, and images typically will have image name and tag. Uh, so let's say we want to pull from uh, Rocker, and maybe it's time to introduce the Rocker. So Rocker, the Rocker project is the official uh, Docker containers for our environment. It's a great place to start if you don't have uh, much of experience with Docker. They, um, it's running by Carl, Derek, and Norm. I'm sure if you are a long, long time in the R community or enough time in the R community, you heard those names. Derek is the author of the CPP uh, library. Um, Noam, I know him because of his workshop for um, GAMS. He has a great uh, resource for GAMS, and, and Carl is a professor. Um, very active also uh, mainly on the, I know him from the Rocker project. So they are creating this wonderful project that they have a, a bunch of images uh, for our use. And if you go to the Docker app uh, and search for Rocker, you will see that uh, uh, they, are, they have many, many, images for different applications. So for example, here you have a MLverse, but I assume it's like a, a machine learning application, uh, CUDA for NVIDIA, Joseph et al. for if you're doing a GIS, uh, and many, many more. Uh, Shiny, different flavors of Shiny, Tidyverse, RStudio, and so on. Um, we will use the best R for the following demonstration. So let's see. Uh, Base. And if you go to the tag, you can see that there are different tags. So for example, if you don't specify the tag, uh, it will pull the latest, which probably it's a version 4.40. But let's say that you want older versions, so you can find, let's say, uh, version 4.2.2. So you specify the tag and you pull that version. So let's uh, start with, uh, we can copy this one, let's say we want the version 4.4 .4 and go to the command line and plug it here. And it's uh, download. I think the reason that it download uh, without uh, the, it, it's I already downloaded it before, so it's cached. It, but if I will do Docker images, you can see that Um, it's over here. And if you want to see how, how the download process is done, so we can delete it. Docker images RM, I think that's the command. And and you see that I, you know, I have here two versions. One is the latest and 4.4. And the reason that uh, last time that I pulled, I didn't specify the 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 tag, so it's pulled the same version. And you see, it won't repull if it's already identified the um, the hash key. And you see, here, this is the hash key. If it's the layers exist, it won't re-download it. So here, in this case, it just add the the label, but essentially on the backend you have one image and not two because they are the same image. So that's what's nice about how Docker is operate. And I can, let me show you like how the download is done because nice. And you see they have, the, oh, they, they don't have the same idea, but essentially they are the same. So let's delete this one. Uh, maybe I need to specify the name.
Okay. Uh, maybe I'm. So it's Docker image RM, not images. And let's also the other tab. Yeah, I think I'm using it in another. Okay, I'm using it in uh, some VS code, so it won't let me. But essentially, that's how you um uh you see like how to download the how it's download. You don't see the download process, but you will see it later in some other images. So um we have the image over here. Let's uh, just confirm that I still have the image. Docker pool. Okay. Uh Docker images give you the list of images. Uh, the, con the image ID is something very useful that uh, in some cases, if you want to reference, you use the image ID. Um, and let's now try to run it. So if you go and use the Docker run and then specify the image name, Docker uh, uh, dash r dash pass, and you get this, you know, you get two things. You get warning and an error. Um, the warning is say, hey, this is was built for a, a AMD, which is Intel, and I'm using uh, ARM. So that's a warning. It still will work, but let's give you, a, 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 you know, just a, uh, going back to what we talked before. Um, that, that that's like uh, the build was is important like the reference of the CPU. And then the error that I'm getting is that if you know this, when you're leaving um, this as argument, when you are running uh, R from the um, terminal is uh, it's one of the arguments. And the reason you get this error is essentially we try to run image in, that is interactive in a regular mode. Um, and that's something that uh, typically, you know, will end up with error. Uh, and the things that we need to add is uh, two arguments, is the interactive and TTY. Um, TTY, I don't know what exactly it is. It's a, something about enable running, uh, keep the, the container alive even if it's static. Um, but let's do this and see what we're getting. So Docker, or maybe before, let's do inspect the image, inspect. So we're going to use the inspect command and Docker. Okay, so you get a long JSON with a lot of information. Um, but there are some useful information. So you will see that, for example, you will have the config, uh, the container config, which might have some useful information. So for example, uh, CMD and, uh, is a command that typically that in the container, if you want to run something in the container, for example, if you want to expose a Shiny app, to run a Shiny app, you will have a command that once you run trigger the container, uh, run shiny up, right? So it's going to be run, there is the uh, run, I forgot the, the command, but it is like the shiny run command and with the reference to the app. Uh, you can see here that there are the environment variables that set, oh, here is, here is the, sorry, here is the command. So the command here is to run up. Um, there are some labels, like you can see who is the author of this uh, image, the license, and so on. The CPU type, the OS, the size. So there's some useful information. Um, and uh, it's worth checking the image when you download to see some of those things on the back end. Uh, that's another nice thing is the layers. So you can see that every layer, there is a unique hash key. And that's what uh, Docker used to identify if the layers exist or not. So in this case, there are one, two, six layers. I mean that they were on the Docker file, there were six commands to build this image. And if I will go and take this image as my base image, I will build on top of it. 
it will air attach those those layers and will add additional new layers on on top of of those layers. So let's now try to run it in interactive mode. So Docker run. And you see, we got a warning, but now we are in R, uh, running on the terminal. You have version 4.4. Um, and well, if you want to try it, you do print hello world. If I would be able to spell it. And yeah, that's R, right? So it's R for, you know, like any, like if we run it on your local machine. One thing to notice that, um, if I will do the deal command, uh, that's not my uh, local file system. This is the container uh, local file system. So technically, if I will now try to run scripts, unless I package it inside the container, I won't be able. If I will create new script and save it, um, I won't be once I um, leave the container, it's gone. So that's like a formal, uh, a formal uh, state of this container um, that you trigger it, but it's locked. So there is no any connection to the outside world. And that's where you want to add volume, right? Because you want to keep your code persistent when you are saving that once you finish the station of the container, you can still have the code saved somewhere and commit it to Git. So we will leave, let's quit. And once I quit, uh, I don't want to save. Um, essentially, it uh, terminate the process. Um, and now we see how to mount. Before, actually before, let's do something else. Let's rerun again. And let's do this. Uh, in parallel, I wanted to show you the Docker PS. So essentially, I want to see which containers are now running. And I have too many running now. But essentially, you see, this is we triggered 17 seconds ago, and this is the container. So for example, if you want to terminate it without leaving, let's say it's stuck or something, you can use uh, a little bit the awkward command, but it's called docker kill. And the ID, container ID, and you see over here, it's terminate the process. Um, another thing that um, we can check in a second, let's do the mounting. So let's keep it side by side, I will, resize it. Um, so let's go over. Uh, another command for mounting is the X, uh, X uh, command, which enable you to SSH to the container. So one of the, you saw that we open the container, it will automatically will open uh, are, but if you want to debug or want to see what's going on on the backend, go to the file system from the terminal. This command will enable you to access the shell. In this case, the shell is bash. And uh, like you are SSH to any terminal or server. So uh, running container without mounting volume, it's a little bit problematic. It's, not as useful when you're writing a code because you cannot really keep your code persistent. And let's do the following. So what if you go to the repository and you will see that I have um, data um, folder and I have scripts. Uh, in the data folder, I have a file, uh, the iris data set in CSV file. And in the script, I have our script that I want to run just to illust illustrate the, the process. So 
let's now mount those two um, folders to the container that we used before. So we're going to use the V or the volume argument. And the way that, and I think it's true to most of the arguments that you do mapping between the local system and the container, you will have on the left side, you will have the local mapping. So all the way until the, the semicolon on the left side is the local path on my local machine. And on the right side is where you want to map it on the container. So we don't have necessarily have the script folder. Uh, so it will, it will be created similarly uh, for the data. We'll do the, the same thing. So let's try to go to the terminal again and docker run. Okay, so you see I have here the same command we used before. I'm adding the volume. So uh, the first volume will uh, mount the scripts folder. The second one, the data, you can do as many as you, you want as long as you are not running out of a uh, memory. And then we'll end up with the Docker that we want to run, the image we want to run. And now if I will do, let's see if I will see it over here for the deal, you can see that I have script. So if I want now, and this script is essentially print hello world. So if I will do source scripts, okay. I'm guessing it's a low world. Dot R. Okay, so it's working. And if I will modify it uh, now on either on either side, it will it will automatically sync. So if, let's say I'm going out to VS Code to illustrate it, and I'm going to the script folder, and I'm now adding. And uh, happy Tuesday. Okay, and I will run the same thing again. You will see it will reflect. Um, so this is a typical workflow that you, if you're writing code, you mount some uh, folders that you can sync your code. Otherwise, it will gone once you terminate the process. The next thing we want to add is, so let's say quit this one. Oh, not quite quit. Okay. Um, the next thing that we want to run is to add environment variable. Now environment variable is a a uh, very important concept uh, when you are using Docker. Um, I will start to say, never store anything sensitive on your uh, your image. When you're building image, you should not save no, neither data nor credentials. Like that's a big no, uh, because even if you have your own private a repository or a Docker registry, you should avoid it because it's a not safe. It's a bad practice to store both data and uh, all credentials inside the container. And this is where mounting help you to get data inside the container during the runtime and environment variable to load uh, credentials. For example, API keys, uh, password, and so on. So let's say that we want to um, going back to the keynote um, to add environment variables. So you can use the environment or the E argument, and then you just set the name of the uh, environment variable. In this case, my var, 
and the value. Uh, so that as simple as it is. So if we do again over here, so docker run, and I hope to find it from my history. Okay, so here I'm adding my, ver my var, and I set it as my value. And I use the same thing as before. I'm mounting those two uh, folders. Let's run it. And if I will do get, is it sys dot get env and my, okay. So we got a, a environment variable. Um, Next thing, uh, we talked about uh, terminating with the Docker kill, a container running container, um, deleting, so we saw how to delete. If it's running, it will give you the message that you saw before. Um, I think we don't need a break. If we want, if anyone thinks that we need a break, just ping me, I will pause. I know it could be very boring <laughs> when we get to the width of the containers. Any questions so far? You surviving? All right. <laughs> awesome. Um, so before we go to VS Code, uh, let's see, you know, I, that's how I started. The, I started with the R Studio inside uh, a container, um, and uh, that might be a good you you know solution uh, for some use cases. Uh, it's a hack, so it's not like a enterprise ready tool that you can use it. First, it is from license perspective. I don't think you can use it in an enterprise setting. Uh, it's best on. Our uh, our server. So essentially, I, I'm not sure if Posit still maintaining the R server. So this was something that at the beginning, many years ago, uh, R Studio was available both in local and R server. And then over time, they moved to Workbench and other tools. That I, mean, I think that as of today, it's not the probably. Either it's still under maintenance, but probably on the way to uh, deprecate. So it's a nice, it's actually really nice. It's enabled you to run R inside a container um, in a in using the exact same setting. It's just uh, uh, you're going to use the browser um, to run R, and it's on the back end you can mount your settings, your local settings, and and some uh, folders. So maybe go again to over here and you know you can see here like this is uh on the main page they give you instruction how to uh run our studio. Let's you know what let's start with this. So let's uh quit. Okay, so we're using the RM argument. Um, the RM argument essentially, what it does is, uh, once you kind of like cancel the run, you exit the terminal. It killed the the process. So it's a recommend to use this uh, to avoid having it running after you finish to work with it. Uh, uh, we're using argument here, we had a password and I set it as your, and that's like the default, your password. Uh, the other thing is that in this case, uh, we expose the application uh, on the container. So uh, we want to map, it's ex once you trigger the server, it's exposed to some port and the port argument or the P-P enable you to map it to your local machine. And that's like how you make a connection, like we mount a folder. So again, like the 
uh, left side, you can define the port on your local machine, and that's the port on the container. So actually, if we will go and do over here, Docker inspect, and that's the name of the container, Docker. Okay. Studio. So the tag is 4.4. .4. I have now 4.4. .4. And you see here there are much more many layers. Um, and we want the config. So the configure, there is a command in it and it, that's triggered the, the R server and should be exposed, exposed port. So you see here, 8787. So that's a way, like if you have like a shiny app that is in a container or anything that's inside the container and it's exposed some, uh, some application, you are trying to understand uh, what is the mapping. So just go to use the inspect and check the, uh, the config. So let's go ahead and run this one. Okay, so you see now it's download because I have probably different tagging and it's going to the latest uh, image and it's go by the layer. Let's first uh, download and then extract and eventually install it. So now you see uh, it's uh, it's running. So it, you know it's stuck over here. You won't be able to use the container while it's running unless you run it in a detached mode. And if I will go now to my browser, the local, and uh, by default the username is R Studio. And the password is your password as set. And now we are running uh, version four point four on the um, on the browser, um, and it's uh, our studio. So that's a might be for some people uh, some middle ground before you want to go to VS Code. Uh, it's very easy to run. It's a hack but you can customize it and we show how to customize it. Uh, again, like you see the same problem that you don't have access to your local folder. So let's go ahead and fix it. Uh, so if I would do control C, you see that's where it will terminate. This is why we use the RM. So it's finished the process. And now let's do Docker run. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to mount those two folders. The other thing we're going to do is to mount, um, so now you see in my browser that's like it's by, it's the vanilla settings. But let's say that you want to pair the settings of uh, your R server with the one that you have on your local machine. So this is where you want to use Docker run with and mount your config for file. Sorry, I'm trying to go between the windows. So this is, uh, you should have, you should find out the path on most, like probably it's a, not sure windows, but on Mac, it's on the, on the root folder config, dot config R studio. And you want to mount it to the ohm our studio, this is like the main path on the uh, on the image. And this, you show them, you will see like how it's uh, mapping the, the settings. And the rest is the same. So let's do Tokyo Run, if it's our oh,
Okay. And again, it's trigger. Um, and now I can go back to the browser. Let's refresh it. So again, the user is our studio. And the password is your Okay, so that's exactly my my local setting is this is the the call of him. Uh, I have now access to the data, right? So you can see I can, um, let's say I want to load the data. Okay, I'm missing packages, so it won't let me, but essentially uh, if you add a package, you can install, you can read it with the, uh, the read the CSV. Um, you have the script. You see it, we changed, we did it before, uh, the, the AP Tuesday. Um, and the nice, the other thing that is nice that um, it's also heritage, I believe my uh, my code snippet. So you see all my code snippets, like if I have a lot of deep layer code snippet, uh, is it go by or so on. So it's all available. So it's kind of like nice that you can have heritage your settings and feel the same as you would on your local R uh, studio settings. Um, again, that's a might be a solution for some folks that uh, prefer to stay with the R studio and they don't need the license or they don't have the limitation of the license. Um, so that's probably something to think about. One thing to talk before we move, move to VS code um, I will go back to the slide. Is you can see that the Docker run can can really go and explode. Um, as you're adding more and more arguments, uh, and the uh, one way to make it more concise is using uh Docker Compose. I think I should have a slide somewhere in in down the. Is probably should look at it now. Essentially, Docker Compose, the idea of Docker Compose is to move your Docker run command into a YAML format. And then, you know, once you figure out like what you want to run and it's a, like you have a project, you want to just come and trigger the, the project inside a container. So you set a Docker Compose. And um, you can see like it's kind of like translate the, the arguments that we use, the volume, the environment, uh, the image and so on um, into a YAML format. You just do Docker compose up and that's it. Uh, so that's kind of like the, you don't want to write each time that you are, if you have a repeated process when you're using Docker run, you probably should think about or consider to move to a Docker compose. Essentially, it's, it's uh, equivalent to the, the to the dev container JSON file that we will see later. The manifest of the of the run. All right. Um, I think before we start the Docker file, and this is the last part of the um, the last component of the Docker before we move to VS Code. Why don't we take a five minutes break? Um, and uh, we, we return and then we cover the Docker file. And then the last part is the fun part is uh, setting uh, VS Code with R. So now it's on my end is 123. How about we will return at uh, 28, two minutes before. And I will try to go over the question. I was mute when I answered before, but Megan, you asked about the slides. Uh, the short answer, I don't think I was mute, so I was speaking to myself. The short answer is that I need to uh, create a, let me, I will do it now. I will move it into a PDF format, it's in Keynote and it won't work on Windows. I don't think you can run it uh, outside of Mac, so I will create a, a copy.
I see a question about the the, the Docker run with the environment variable. Um, let me maybe go back to the script. So essentially, let me oh, this zoom it to screen and zoom together is like killing me. Okay, so the question was about environment variable. Okay, so the idea of, uh, I mean, generally you want to use environment variables whenever you want to pass some information to the con to the image during the runtime. So for example, API keys would be a great example. And the way to set it is use the E argument of the Docker run. Um, and you essentially add after the E, uh, the name of the variable and the value you want to assign. Um, and then once you run it, it will automatically, when you open the session, it should be available on the R session, this variable. We'll see a more robust, in VS Code, there are more robust way to, um, add environment variables. Like you can have a file that you load with variables or just set on the uh, on the JSON file. Megan, you ask about the PDF, so it should be now available. Let's see. Not available yet, so let me. Okay, so if you want, anyone want wants to follow the slide, uh, there is a PDF version also. I will. Sorry, Kyle, I just sent you a direct message of the slides. I'm not sure. Okay. Another question. Um, How I source the hello world. Uh, could you? Um, yeah, sorry. Provide more? I, I, yeah. I was behind because I, I wasn't typing. I wasn't getting the volumes to mount. So how did you? Uh, how did you source the, the the hello world file once you got it running? Oh, okay. So let's let's uh, go again over here. Um, so I had to mount the folder, so to use the volume argument. So Docker run, let's see which one was it. Let's say, let's run this one. So in this example, you can see, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Um, I add the volume argument and I'm mounting the scripts folder to the script to, to a script folder inside the root uh, for the, the root uh, file system of the container. So if I run this and I will do now dir, you will see that I have here the script folder. And if I will use the source like you would use on your local file system or, or R, the source command and uh, I need the, the reference, so I'm now in the root, so I need to reference the scripts. Folder, 
and the file is hello world dot r close the brackets and you get it did i answer your question yes thanks rami you're welcome all right um let's go back yeah and the slides are available now uh you have like the pdf version um so if anyone cannot run their keynote so this is uh, the alternative all right so that's the last part and i will go fast because we have another hour um i will go try to go faster on the docker file um it's important component if you want to build and not just use a building and like probably if you start to work with containers that's like you know you cannot avoid it so going back to the workflow that we mentioned before we talked about the image and container this is the run the run command enable you to move the image into running container now we are kind of like going back to the beginning and talk about how to generate a, a, a image so that's kind of like before you get the image you need to set the docker file and then you need to run the docker build to generate the image so those are there are many comments but those are the basic one um, that you use in a docker file so docker file is it's like unique it's not yaml it's not json it's like unique to docker at least to my knowledge, I don't think there is anything similar that um, enable you to set the, the environment inside a container. So you typically will start with from, which essentially you will always start from some base image unless you use from scratch, which like you're getting a, a complete empty environment and you need to install the OS. Uh, and that's like, you know, it's, there's not some, there's, unless you have a specific reason, you should not do it. But essentially, typically we'll start from, like for example, we saw before, we use the Rocker image, the Besa or the Shiny or the R Studio. So you can start from there as a reference. I typically start from Ubuntu. I build, I install my R uh, settings. Um, and again, depending on the level of how much you want to dip go deep into the build. Uh, as you start from scratch, you can customize more and be more minded about dependency or uh, make sure that you only install, you know, whatever required and to reduce the size. The size also should be a factor. Uh, so that's the form. The label enable you to uh, track some uh, comments like you saw before there was the, on the rocker, the the license, the maintainer name, uh, and so on. Run inside a Docker file, essentially uh, enable you to run commands on the command lines inside the container. Um, so for example, if you want to create a directory inside the container during the build time, you do run and then make dir and then of the directory. Uh, if you want to run some bash scripts or run and then bash and the bash script. If you're using files like uh, you're copying files from your local machine to run inside the container, you will use the copy because you need to move it from, that's like the point that you can transfer files um, from your local machine to the container. There is a more advanced way to do it by mounting volume during the build, similar to what we saw on the runtime. I, to be honest, I never tried. So, but it's I know that people are. It's an it's alternative for copying files. The advantage is like once you are done the build, uh, the files are not there. Environment and probably should also as uh, env and arg are way to set environment variables or arguments. Uh, the difference between environment variables and arguments, arguments can be leveraged during the build time, uh, and but they are, after you finish to the build, they are gone. 
uh, environment variable will be available after the build time and you can use them during the runtime. CMD uh, enable you to run commands during the runtime. So once you build and you want, for example, whenever you are running to run some commands. So for example, we saw on the R studio, the, there was a NIT, which calling the server. Uh, so you use the CMD. Those are the main one, there are others, but those kind of like can enable you, if you're getting started, those are the one you want to focus on. So let's say see example of building. Uh, let's define a scope. Uh, we want to use the Rocker R base image uh, as our baseline. And we want to add a Vim, a, a text editor. Uh, we want to install dplyr and we want to add arguments. Um, and the reason we can't use arguments, if you want to customize the best R tag, and we, we see in a second why we want to do it. So I will go now to VS Code, and I have the example here if you want to follow. Uh, so under the Docker files, you have Docker file, let me just close some of the Um, and the um, notation that you use for Docker file, anything you can use anything as long as it starts with Docker file, and then after that you can add like um, you know dot and something. It's a convenience when you are working with multiple Docker file like dev, prod, and so on. Uh, but as long as it starts with Docker file and see it's recognized that, that this is Docker file. So the first um, and let me also increase the font. And I probably should not have it. So we start with pointing the baseline image. So we're going to use the Rocker R base as our baseline. Um, and then we, because it's in Linux, we want to install uh, Vim. So we're going to use the apt-get update and install. That's the process for, think about it like when you are Installing from Crane, that's the equivalent to installing from Crane like a package for Debian. So you will use you will use typically apt-get update and apt-get uh, install, which is equivalent also to pip update pip install or similar package manager uh, operation. Um, important to use the dash y, which means that if there are prompt like if prompt a question, it will automatically answer yes. Otherwise, your build will fail because it gets stuck and you cannot. Uh, type during the build. So you want it automatically, it will uh, answer any question. That, uh, I mean, in this case, yes, you can set it as no, depending on your context. And then that's the package we want to install. Um, in a more, you know, typically in a more robust build, you will have many Debian um, dependency and that you will use it to install all of them. Then uh, we want to set a, a folder settings. We're going to use our script to install uh, the package. So let me pull. We're going to use this. It's a very simple, simple R script that what it does is just install uh, packages uh, and the package deployer. And, and so we, we want to copy the file because uh, it exists on, on my local machine and want to copy it to the container. So we're going to use the copy command and we're going to copy it to the settings folder we created. And then we're going to run it from the command line, the script. So we're going to use the R script to trigger the file, which is going to install the, um, the dplyr library. So Let's see the build process. So that's a, a very simple uh, format for build. Um, we're going to use docker build, that's the command, and then there are different arguments. Uh, the dot here is saying my file, like I'm giving a context of where I store my files. In this case, we are copying the R script and it's stored in the same folder that we are running 
the Docker file. So that's the context of my file system. If you're using a different folder, let's say you're using a subfolder, then that you want to copy from there. So you need to specify it here. We specify the name of the file, of the Docker file with the F argument. So here in this example, it's a Docker file dot X one. Uh, I'm using argument called progress equal plan. I want to see the build. Otherwise, to give you a concise view, the, the advantages of using the this argument that when things get broken, you can actually go and see what was there, or it's easier to debug. Um, and then I'm going to tag it. The naming convention for tagging is typically your I'm using Docker app, so it's my Docker app account username, so our Crispin, and then dash the name of the tag, the name of the image, and then using the uh, the column, semicolons to, uh, and then I'm adding the uh, the tag. So in this case, the tag is X1 for exercise one. So let's go ahead and see how it's going to work. So I need to be in the folder. So is it Docker? And you see, I have um, three folder, three files. Um, we have the install underscore packages R, and we have the first one that we're going to test. So Docker file, and let's run this one first. So I'm going to do docker build and hopefully I should have it from the memory. No, I do not have it. So let's write it down. Docker build and the context is this folder and the file is docker file exercise one. Um, progress equal plan and I want to tag it as our uh, Crispin and we call it um uh, maybe and and we tag it as exercise one. All right. I think that should work. Okay, now, so you see, you get the full log and now you see this is like inside R, this is the installation of uh, of Dplyr. It might take some couple of, you know, seconds until it finished because there are a lot of dependencies, um, but essentially uh, that's the process and you see it's, it's straightforward. Um, while it's installing, and that's like mentioned, like uh, imagine you have like now, 15 libraries that you need to install and they are heavy, you might spend like half an hour. Uh, so while it's running, let's go to the next um, exercise. We want to add uh, arguments. So we're going to go, let's go look, take a look at the second Docker file. And the idea of using arguments is to make your code more dynamic. So for example, in the future, you want to be able to be flexible to change the R version. So by default, it's it's pulling the latest, but let's say that you want to be able to control your build, or let's say that you're running multiple builds. You have a matrix of build, and uh, you want to be able to, with one Docker file, to build many versions. So here I'm using the arg, and I'm setting tag as an argument. You can add, and it's very common to uh, set a default value and then I assign it here as the value. So you see that the, this is the exact same as the previous one. I just uh, modify, edit the tag and set it as argument. And to run it from the command line is essentially um, if you run it like this, it will work um, because we set the default argument. But let's say that you want to specify the version, you can use the build arg uh, argument to set the, the argument name and the, the value of the argument. So let's go ahead and make, let's see maybe a different version of R. 
I'll go back to the terminal. Still running, so let's say do side by side. Let's say open a new one. And this is Docker files. All right, so let's run the same command, Docker build, and let's change first. We want to change it to the second Docker file. And let's add build arg. Make sure that I'm tag and let's go to the browser and see other tags. Um, so let's take version 4.3.3. 4.3.2. Let's see I'm missing dot. And let's change also the... Sorry, I'm... Let's just resize it to change the version two. So you first you saw if here now it's a uh, it's using version four three three. So there is a um, it's that it does not download the the full image. It's just download the missing uh layer so you see here it start to download it might take a few minutes um but then here it's already start to install the file so that's why it's very useful to use environment variable and over it finished the oh we can get rid of this one so that's the first image we ran and we can actually test it so by the end you see you get the name of the image so let's try to run it and you see by default it's at the docker.io because i logged in so that's like if i want to push it so it will probably like docker push and the name and it will start to upload it um let's just there's no point of waiting so let's say now test the image uh so if i do docker run in the same command we used before the interactive and i just change then the reference for the image and now if i will try to and I increase the font if i try to load library Deplier. It didn't find. <laughs> uh, so it could be that the build fail, and that something also could happen. Well, let me check. Yeah, you have a typo in the library. Oh, most likely I have a typo. That's like most likely. <laughs> it's more reasonable. Library. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, God. Um, yeah, so. Um, that's how you bring your own libraries. And I will talk toward then about strategies, but so far what I show you, it's more learning. Most people won't uh, use this type of workflow. You understand like it's very hard, at least for me, developing on the command line. Some people have friends that they love to work on the command lines. I feel like working in idea like our studio which i showed before or in vs code it's much more convenient um and i think now we can pivot uh to vs code before going to vs code any questions something i missed oh that's important. 
uh, system prune. Uh, you want to use it once in a while um, to clean your um, to clean to clean your uh, storage uh, the disk disk usage. Uh, so I think A is like a, essentially saying clean whatever you can. If I will do it. Sometimes it's clean too much and then like you will need to install it from scratch, but I, I hope it won't kill the image that we need for the next demo. It might not be smart to do it now, uh, but um, but you see it will go and find the layers that they were not in use and you see 24 gigabyte. That's a lot that you just clean up. It's quickly add up if you are building a lot, it's quickly add up, if, especially like you can run multiple version and uh, they, that's the trade-off between um, having a lot of layers that enable you to, whenever you are building, to go faster and to the size that will balloon fast. All right. We talked about Docker Compose. So let's now go to the dev containers. So dev containers is the extension, is the name of the extension of VS Code is, is um, what enable us to open a session inside a container. General requirements, right? So you need to have a Docker engine. Uh, so if you're running on Linux, it's a, you can just install it directly. If you're running on a Mac OS or Windows, you need to have something like Docker desktop or equivalent. You need to have some image or a Docker file, one of those two. Um, and then VS Code, of course, the dev containers extension installed. You need to have a folder named dot dev containers and inside you need to have the manifest of the build using the dev containers dot json last but not least it's optional you want to have also a dot vs code folder that you can customize the settings of the project that's not a must but it's it's nice to have Um, and that's kind of like, you know, um, how it will work. Um, you will have the settings will define the VS code settings inside the folder or the project. It will work even if you're not using the containers, it will work when you open a folder, which is equivalent in our the project. Uh, but it's come, it's very handy when you are also using it inside, uh, the dev containers, the dev containers is the main pivot here. Um, nice thing is that by default, it's mounting your local folder. So you don't need to worry about setting arguments of volume and so on. You can add more um, folders to mount. For example, to give you some use cases, I'm running R inside a container. I need to authenticate Snowflake and I have some keys store on my local machine. So I'm mounting uh, this folder that I can do the authentication with the key. Um, if you want to save data on a different folder and so on, so let's give you, you can mount more folders using the dev containers.json file. So I think um, before we go to the dev container, File. Those are the arguments, the most common arguments. One is that you can either use one of the two build, uh, which if you use the build uh, options mean that you are going to reference to a Docker file. And essentially it's equivalent to the Docker build command that we saw before. It's essentially, it's, it's a wrapper to the Docker build. If you use, um, and it will build during the launch time and then run it. If you use images, it only will execute the run. Um, customization argument enable you to have different settings for VS Code, such as the extension. And so it's, it's one of the most common one. Uh, run args enable you to add some running arguments during the run time. For example, you want to add a file with environment variable. So that's a, a one use case. 
um, remote and is uh, this uh, argument enable you to add local uh, to create like a environment variables. We'll see it also in the final build. Uh, post create command is it's a nice command. I didn't find it much of a use. Uh, enable you to run commands after you you launch the container. So think about it like this: if you have, if you take the best R image that we saw before, we point it as as the build, and then once we load the session, we can call the R script that installing packages, and it will run it then. But then like think about every time that you're launching it, it will you will have to wait a few minutes until you finish to install Dplyr in this case. Even if you have many, many packages, it even will be longer. So that's kind of like there are some use cases I I not really using it. Good to know. So let's go to VS Code. Uh let's see a few examples. We are um start with some simple examples. Um, let me close those to clean up a little bit here. What we're going to do, we're going to use, I created a folder called examples. And in order to run those examples, we will have to open those folders uh, separately in a different session because uh, in order to demonstrate, you need to have the dot dev containers on the root of the folder like you have it over here. Uh, so let's go to the terminal. And tutorials. Uh, and let's go to the first one. Okay. Um, Chris, the font. Okay, you don't see anything because it's a dot dev container. So if we do do that a, so now you can see it. It's hiding, hitting a folder. Um, so one way to log in to open a new session, it's either you can do code dot, and it will open it in a VS Code, or you can go to file and do new window. Okay, you can choose one of the other. To to make to set the code dot to work from your terminal, I think you need to do something like it work natively in Windows. In Mac, you will need to do shell command install code. So it's already installed in my end, but if you are first time you're using it, so um, go to the menu, which is command P. Uh, type the greater sign and look for shell command install code command in path. And once you, do, you you are running it one time and you restart your terminal, it will be available. Okay, so now you see we are in the folder in the first example. We have a, a dev containers, and now it's a very simplistic one. Uh, we are going to pull open a session and we just want Ubuntu image, plain image. So let's go uh, and I will increase the font. Uh, again, to open it, you go to this, uh, I never understood this sign, but it's uh, like a smaller and greater on top of each other uh, and open a remote window. That's the options. And we want to do reopen in container. Now you can go and see the log. It's 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 running really fast because um, the first time that you will do it on your local machine, it will go if the image is not available on your machine, it will go and uh, pull it on the backend. But if uh, and that's the first time it's cache it, the next time it will be immediately like you saw now. So just take into take into account that first time might be slower on your end. Uh, and essentially, we are now, you see, I'm on here, I have 
I'm inside the terminal. Um, if I do dot less uh, ls uh, dash a, I'm inside. It's mount my local folder, and if I want to see the container, if I do cd uh, backslash, and that's like the file system of the container. So we have access for both. Um, so that's a, a a very simple way to do it using the uh, image argument. You can obviously, if you will change it to, um, let's say we call it uh, Rocker, uh, our base, the one that we used before. And now we will really, just for to show you, it won't, like if I try now to call R, there's nothing because the Ubuntu image doesn't come without. But if I will now replace it with our base and rebuild, And you see that you can go and check the log. And now, okay, so we are in now. It won't be, uh, you know, it won't be as useful because it's still like a kind of like a not customized. So if you have a script of R, you try to send it over here, it won't talk with each other. This is why you need the settings files. Um, so that's the first example. Very, very simple. Um, and let's go to the next one. So in the next one, uh, we're going to see the build. So in this case, uh, we're going to use a build and we need to point out for the Docker file. So you see here in the in the same folder, we have a Docker file. So that's why we set the context as the same folder. And this essentially do the same as we did before, it's just, uh, using the from and uh, pointing out to the Ubuntu. So I will say in the interest of time, I won't run it, uh, but you get the gist. It's like if you have some, um, that's a, like if you are in a constant development and you are modifying and you want to test uh, your Docker file, your build, that's a, a nice way to do it because uh, you can change try to run it and it's nicer to do it from here compared to the command line. It's much more interactive. At least for me, I'm sure some people would prefer command line, but like it's it's a good alternative in my opinion. So let's jump to the paired example. And in this example, um, we are essentially running the same example we did from the command line. Uh, we are uh, pointing out for this Docker file uh, that copying the install underscore packages dot r into the uh, container and running the script. Um, and you see that I'm using here. So now we are adding arguments, and again that. Anything under the build, if you go to the documentation, you will see that it's fairly using the same language, but, but some in some cases it's not one to one. So instead of build args, you just use args. And you need to, you're using it in a JSON format. So here I'm setting the tag to 4.40. Um, so again, like we had another layer, we had no arguments. And Let's see the last one, and maybe we can run the last one. So the same settings, right? We are running the same Docker file. Uh, we're setting the tag of the of the R version, but now we start to over here. To, we started to customize the VS Code, and we're using the extension under so the customization uh, enable enable you to modify multiple stuff, but we care more about the extension. So under the customization, you have VS code, and then you can specify the extensions. And here, for example, we are installing the following extensions. So uh, our debugger is extension that enable you to uh, debug code. Um, our editor support is the main extension for VS code for R. 
Uh, this is extension that uh, Posit released last week uh, that enable you to run Shiny. You could run Shiny without it, but it's nice that it's more embedded. Uh, Quarto is a, probably the extension that I use most in VS Code and other stuff also. So for example, uh, draw, draw IO, if you are familiar uh, to get diagrams, um, if, uh, extension to reformat the uh, YAML files, markdown, and so on. Um, also having, usually I also had the Python extension for the main Python extension and then Jupyter. Um, just to show off maybe about, that's my also one of my favorite extensions, the Markdown all-in-one. If you're editing uh, Markdown files, that's a really nice and interactive way to run it. Um, I'm now using a huge font, so it's it's a, it seems like very uh, condensed, but once you're using a normal font, uh, that's usually how I edit my documents. It's reflect as, as I change. So why don't we try to run this and then we can talk about R with So we're going to okay, so, uh, I didn't add the the environment variable, but I will I will show it in the final version. So this this uh, version uh to summarize is building, it's pointing out to a Docker file. Uh, this Docker file um, build, um, use a version 4.4 from the Rocker and install dplyr, and then adding some extensions. So let's go ahead and see how it will work. The example four, four dot, and So we can go and check the log and you can see because it's installing deeply, it might take some time. That's the concise version, uh, which is sometimes very hard to understand when things break. And I promise you things will break when you start to use Docker. Um, but then like it will speed up the full error log outside and give you like a angry error message. All right, um, I think probably get the gist. Uh, that's less interesting. Let's go to talk about R with VS Code and the dev containers. And I think that's why we are here and dedicate the last few minutes for, for, for this. All right, so general requirements and um, it might sound awkward, but we're using a Python library that's running R, so it's called Radian. Um, the nice thing about Radian that is give you all the code completion, um, uh, the colors, the, the things that you don't have in like, if you're running R from the terminal, like we did so far, it's not uh, as efficient or nice. I will caveat that it's not as nice as our studio. So, you know, <laughs> I'm setting the expectation. Um, then we need image, uh, or you can use the Docker file with the build. Um, we need the VS code, our extension. Nice to have is the shiny in a quarto. Uh, someone asked me about key binding, so I will talk about it. Also, uh, if I will forget, just remind me. Key binding is uh, to make a shortcut, uh, which is um, also not as nice as in our studio, or just different set of mine. Um, okay, let me go back after. So, okay, let's go and now and talk about the final version. So this main example of the Docker 
on the dev containers JSON file is the one that uh, kind of like give you the full our settings. Um, I created I created an advanced image with um the packages that I want to illustrate for this demonstration. So I'm pointing for this image. Alternatively, you can set your own Docker file. I will touch in a second about uh, this image. I'm setting the same extension. Let's just uh, pause and talk about those things here. Um, there are two ways or two main ways that you can pass arguments. One is use the run, sorry, environment variable one is use the run args and set arguments you want to run during the build time. In this case, I'm passing environment file and I'm pointing for the environment file. So the environment file is um, in the dev, dev container and I just call it from convenience dev container dot dev. So think about it when you're working on your local machine and if you are using um, Mac, it's a ZSH env file which where you store your uh, environment variable. I don't, I'm not sure what is the Windows equivalent in 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 uh, Linux, it's a bash something, but it's like where you store your environment variable. So it's enable you to do the same thing. And here, for example, have your just a one variable. Uh, and just the, this is one way that another way is to uh, load from your local environment and variable environment variable. So in this case, uh, assuming that you have this environment variable, uh, you're using the remote env argument and you set environment variable. You, either you can load it from your, that's how you load it from your local uh, environment variable. And you can also, let's say we want to add another environment, another envir environment variable, sorry. It would be like my second var and call it some var, okay? Um, so that's the dev, that's the uh, dev container, uh, JSON file. Um, I think it's already open. So uh, in order for this to work with R and be able to, let's go to, for example, for this script, um, like I showed before in the beginning in the demo, you need to have a terminal open. So the terminal is the equivalent to the console. Um, I'm running now Radian. You can either use R or Radian, but Radian is kind of coming with some nice features. So I set alias uh, as R, and which on the backend, it will call Radian. And maybe I should squeeze it a little bit. Okay. And you see, I have now R. Um, Kyle, you ask about the plots I saw before. If your settings are working well, this is the indication that you can use the plots. When you see here that R uh, is set to the version that I, you know, in the image, and I will talk about it in a second. Um, you see that I have Quarto also installed. And let's say that if I'm doing here command enter, it will send it to the term to their terminal. This is where the settings are handy. Uh, because by default, it, I don't think it will do it, or there is a default behavior. If I will find a setting, but it's under the dot VS code script. Um, so in order to send it automatically to the, you want to set, at least I, I set it to always use active terminal. Uh, otherwise, I think the default behavior is that if you have multiple R, session open, it might send to the one to open first. So for me, it's more convenient to always send to where I, I am, you know, the one that I'm in, I'm seeing. Um, 
if you want to change, you can change. But there are so many other sessions, uh, uh, arguments that you can change. In terms of general requirements, in order to work, you need the following packages. So my build is available over here. And you can see that I have a, a file called dockerfile.besr, which is the all the requirements that I need to run in VS Code. Anything on top of it, it's I can customize to the project. But instead of any time that I'm starting a project to build everything from scratch, I have the VS Code image, and then I'm adding a second one, which uh, I'm adding the the requirements that I need. So let's just take a look over here. Um, I'm using arguments to define the R version that I want to install. Uh, we need to use install Python because, um, and you can see here, if I go to the new terminal, that I'm using a virtual environment because we are installing Radian to run R. So this is, this is now run inside Python. It's running, Python running R. Um, let's just show you an example. Like if I do a deep layer, you see, I can add the code completion and uh, you can, so that's a nice feature um, that, so the color is changing. So it's kind of like a, you can also customize it, but it's, it's not as nice as our studio, but it's better than like the regular R on the terminal. Um, I won't go into the details. Like it's like you probably, if you just started, you probably, you know, either try to run it line by line, understand what it's doing. Um, but essentially, I'm installing here R. I am configure set log all the setting of R. I'm installing Python. I'm installing Quarto. Um, and this is the super important. I need to mount my R profile to the image. Otherwise, when you open the image, it won't identify the, the R extension won't identify the, the R session. And if you try to send code to Radian or try to plot, it won't work. So Kyle, going back to your question, that's the reason they didn't work. I think if you were using my first tutorial, um, and I think that was kind of like the reason. Uh, this is where I'm creating the alias of uh, that whenever I'm launching R, it's pointing to the profile, to the R profile. So I think if I, we can actually test it, if I will do Radian and I will go to some R, So you see, if I'm now going over here, uh, I don't see the R. And if I will go, I don't see it in, in all of them. Maybe it's because of the fonts. Yeah, see if it's, no, it's, it's actually mounting, but I feel like uh, that's like setting the profile um, on the bus script is, Copying it, it's automatically get it. Um, let's just close all of those. Let's talk about the libraries that required. So on the settings files, I'm having a manifest of the VS Code packages. There are two packages that you need in order to be able to run it. One is the language server. The other one is the HTT. PGD, it's a long name or complex name to uh, enable to send the plots to the viewer. So that's uh, essentially those two enable you to run R as a server and be able to the HTTP uh, GD is, is enable you to send plots to the viewer. That's all. Other than that, uh, the rest is just uh, for the demonstration. Um, 
So that's my base R setting. And on top of it, I have the second Docker file, which is essentially um, I'm mounting the, um, I'm starting from the base R. I have the argument to get the CPU because I have version for AMD and version for uh, um, ARM. And then I'm just copying uh, another set of, uh, I have a JSON file with a list of packages I want to have. And it's on the settings files over here. So those are, this is the list of the files that I want to have in the project and you can customize it. I just put some libraries that I'm using for forecasting. So DBI is to connect to database, uh, Lubode to um, reformat the uh, end of time and dates uh, objects, Cibel, Fibel, and FastTS is for uh, time series analysis. So that's, that's kind of like, the settings and then so we talked about the dev dot the dev json and the settings dot json um if you really want to go so you see here that the plot i'm setting it to go directly to use the http gd i will try to change it to false and i try to run it it will use the default and it's uh, not as nice uh, let's go and open our session and let's open the ggplot. Where are my test? Oh, it's actually still working. Maybe I need to refresh, uh, but there is a Sometimes it's a uh, using the kind of like called the best R viewer and it's a uh, external. Um, uh, let's see if there is anything else important over here. The diagnostic. So that's a nice feature. So if you go and open this, you can see this, for example, if you have issues with your code, you will see it over here. So let's just do, let's try it. All right, so you see it's giving me warnings about indent. So you see here it's not indent according to the settings. You can customize the indenting. Uh, if I will do, for example, um, deep layer, and that's a nice thing. You get all the, you want to see the arguments. If you over, you can see the arguments. Um, you can go and open the help. So that's not as, you know, it's fairly similar to our studio. We have five minutes. I just want to see if I missed anything I want to cover before closing up. Just save it. Um, let's just talk, you know, before wrapping up uh, quickly about what could go, what could go wrong. Many things could go wrong. That's the, the important thing. You need to be very patient. It took me a while until I got to a stable version. CPU architecture. Um, can give you two examples. One, uh, I record a, a course with LinkedIn Learning about GitHub Actions. I got to the place. Um, I thought that I'm going to use my laptop. So I said VS Code and anything. And then they had, uh, luckily they had uh, their own machine and it was a Mac desktop with M1. Um, it took me like five minutes to set my whole environment work as smoothly as it worked on my desktop, my laptop. So that's a good example. But like today I was trying to, I didn't plan to run the workshop from uh, my laptop. I plan to do it in my desktop, which is running Intel and things went not, you know, things didn't really run as smooth as I expected. I didn't have time to debug it. So that's one thing, CPU is really critical. Our profile, not seeing going back to uh, Kyle question about the plot is not working. Whenever you don't see 
on the bottom that the R and the version, it's mean that it's not connected. Um, and that's like where the R editor won't work. And you will try to view, use the viewer or anything, it will go to the best R uh, view, which is uh, over. Um, let's talk about strategies. Um, I mentioned I'm using to save time. I'm ever have my the best R VS Code. You're welcome to use it if you want. And then on top of it, I'm adding a dedicate uh, build with the all the, with the packages I need for the specific project. Um. Templates is super useful. I will show in a second. I only use Docker. If I now need to open R, it's easy when you have templates that uh, I don't, I can go to my uh, GitHub account, clone uh, the, fork the template and just open R. I can then modify some environment variable, but it's fairly simple to start a new project and use environment variables and arguments because uh, this is where the, it will provide you with the flexibility. Um, and I can go last thing and feel free to ask questions while I'm showing you some of the resource, resources for this. Uh, so first you have this, this is the workshop. Uh, I will update the, the website for the workshop with the other information. I just need to run a spell checking um if it will All right um anything that i have here you can find so this is the template and this is the full tutorial that i you know all this workshop is based on this tutorial so if you really want to go into small details um you have a step by step uh it's very long so uh, if you have the patient, that's a one resource that you can use. Uh, the template, um, it's essentially you go, do use this template, it's fork it, uh, and then you can customize the uh, your settings. Um, other resources, the, the, this is the, we talked about the Docker Hub, uh, the Rocker, is a great place to start if you don't want to build and you want to get your hands, um, get some practice. Uh, I will go to the Rocker, pull Docker from there and see how it's work. When you're ready, move to the next step and start to customize. This is where you want to start to learn how to build your own images. Um, here, if you go to the main page of uh, VS Code, Dev containers, they have kind of like a good explanation about how does it work and some information about uh, the arguments and so on. So I will pause here. I think we are on time. Happy to stay for questions if there are any. Uh, Kyle, if you are referring to the materials, you definitely you can share. Either I exhausted you, they don't have questions. <laughs> Rami, uh, can I ask a question? Definitely. Yeah. So, so um, if a uh, while I I will I'm using a Docker uh, image, uh, if I want to install some new packages, can I do that? Yes, when you're inside. Yes. Mm -hmm. The only thing is is if it's not on the pre, you know, if it's not exist on the build, once you Terminate the session. Mm -hmm. It will go. Okay, so uh, next so time well. I have to maybe really, like really. build, build yes. a new, new image with those uh, new packages. Okay, got yes. It. Same so thing. that's why um, I I have like my best image with the VS Code requirements, and then I have another image that I build. I have a JSON file, so if I need to add there any images, I'm just going over there and update the version. I also, one thing important is set the versions mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise you're missing the reproducibility. Good point, thank you. <laughs> okay.
That was really great. Thank you so much. And thanks for sharing all those resources. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, thank you so much. I, and you can still share it. I'm not cutting it. Still take more questions. I just wanted to and then say thanks. Thank you. There was a question. Feel free. Um, if you have questions, you can ping me um, I don't know, in LinkedIn or in the or open issue on the uh, repository of the workshop. If you have any things that I'm sure, like if you first time, it won't work on first time. Like, like uh, there is a learning curve. I promise you, you're going to have a learning curve, but it's worth it. Thank you, Rami. I think I figured out what my issue was. I. <laughs> I ha I was so far zoomed out that uh, my access labels on my plots just look so tiny. And so every time I saw stuff online, they, they looked good. You know, the, the points were normal size. But I think because I had everything shrunk down so much, it just looked yeah. bad. But all like I, I got the session to attach. Um, so I got the R 4.4 at the bottom. You know, everything was working fine with Cordo. Um doing all that stuff but whenever i was just doing a standalone r script outside of cordo i would render a plot and i'm thinking man this this is yeah, ugly that, you know that's I'm like the exactly. without when it's not mounting the r and that's like i think i think we in the past we were chatting about it somewhere and it took me a while to understand it uh but that's like the i feel like now i'm kind of like in my environment is very stable do you mind if I show you real quick, just to kind of make sure that I'm on the right yeah, yeah. path with what you're saying? Yeah. Um, I'm getting to it. There we go. Yeah. So I was I was so far zoomed out that these are really really tiny. And same thing. Yeah. And and, and if you go, um, there is I tried the three dots. Like this is even nicer viewer than the one I show. If you go on the plot you have options to change it to dark mode and yeah, that's, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's like a using a, um, to zoom in. And if you yeah. change a, one of the options there, like the one to the left. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah a, that's pretty neat to see. Yeah. But even like when I would pull back so far, it would just, uh, let me see if it does it. You know, every, like these, the labels would get so tiny, you know, but mm -hmm. I mean, this is a typical size that I would script in. So, you know, I, I thought nothing of it until, you know, sure enough, you bring it back to a normal size and yeah, really simple fix. Sorry to take up the time. No, that's awesome. I'm happy that you were able to figure out everything that you did today. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions. And if you have any questions, feel free to ping me.